This has been a production of the Anwar Deterrence Center, a 501c3 that seeks to educate key decision makers, stakeholders, and the public to ensure a broader understanding of the nation's strategic nuclear deterrent. Our executive producer is Kimberly Charrington, and this episode has been engineered and mixed by David Frontal. Help us grow our followers by sharing it and follow the show on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter at NuclearCast. Welcome back to another exciting episode of NuclearCast. Of course, as always, I am Adam Wilder, and today we have a great guest. Now, some of you, many of you probably already know the name Joe Buff. But Joe is, you know, uh, I don't know if you knew this about him, but he's actually uh, an MIT trained mathematician and he spent much of his career in the actuary world. And then he wrote uh, probably about 20 years ago, he wrote a a series of techno thrillers uh, that were, you know, they were the the Jeffrey Fuller novels, you know, that were about uh, submarines and then in the last, I don't know, handful of years or so, he's written uh, a number of books on nuclear deterrence. And when we were talking earlier, uh, before the episode, maybe a few weeks back, he said, hey, if if I were to come on Nuclecast, what I would want to do is talk about how you apply actuarial sciences to nuclear deterrence. And I thought, Wow. That is a topic that we've never talked about, and it's it's an interesting way to think about deterrence. And so with that, Joe, welcome to NucleCast. And thank you for having me, Adam. And also, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year to all of your listeners out there. Well, well thanks. Same to you. Yes. Let me Go uh, begin by explaining what actuaries do what they know and how they work. But as I do that, um, I'd like people to think in terms of, boy, this sounds exactly like what people do when they're developing nuclear deterrence posture. Uh, Firstly, what do actuaries do? Uh, They work in the financial industry in pensions and insurance addressing some of the major calamities that can befall people in life, particularly death or living too long and running out of money, um, disease, disability, property damage, and so on. Um, What they know is that the right answer to figuring out what the premium should be for a given insurance policy is neither zero nor infinity, but something somewhere in between that is very challenging to figure out well enough. Then what they do is use a combination of modeling, mathematical, technical, uh, as well as curbside knowledge of many disciplines such as economics, psychology, law, and on and on, and come up with a calculation that keeps the insurance company from going bankrupt in either of two ways. Firstly, if the premiums are too high, then the company will never sell any, but it does have to still cover its overhead, including the salary of all its actuaries, and it'll go bankrupt. If the premium is too low, the stuff will sell like hotcakes, and you'll go bankrupt as soon as you start having to pay claims that don't have any money. Um, That being the case, What actuaries do is they have a series of approaches, concepts, techniques that they've developed over the decades that they've learned, sometimes the hard way, really go into helping to solve this problem on the bigger team in an insurance company or corporate pension plan, a team that includes people from all kinds of skills, sales force, underwriters, the executive suite, um, various administrators, and so on. Um, Now, before I say anything more about the four basic techniques that actuaries use, I will now, as you may have already, draw some quick parallels to the problem of national defense in a dangerous outside world. 
what people who think about nuclear deterrence do is address some of life's major calamities, the worst of all imaginable man-made calamities, nuclear war, and then try to figure out how to mitigate it, prevent it, and at least if it happens, limit it and alleviate its worst outcome, which is, of course, sadly, the utter um, extinction of the human race. And just as in the setting of the premiums for an insurance policy, the people who decide on America's nuclear posture look at a question, how many nuclear warheads are enough for us? And there are two extremes, neither of which is survivable in the long run, one of which is global zero or at least unilateral zero, which let's not go into how stupid that is. We heard it, you know, covered over and over again already by many others. Um, and the other solution is an arms race to infinity, and that is as destructive in the other direction. So sadly, the conundrum that we face, which is what makes it complicated, and what people are arguing over between the different camps and factions, is that the right answer is somewhere between zero and infinity, mathematically speaking, but it's not at either pole. And how you go about figuring out, okay, here's a good solid figure, it's the same problem that actuaries face. And as I began to learn and then think about nuclear deterrence, and I networked with established pros, like a key mentor of mine has been Peter Husey. Um, he's been a mentor by editing of looking at everything I've written and marked it up for me, and I've learned tons from him. Um, and many other people whose names I don't have permission to mention, but they've been helpful as well, is it really is a comparable process. In fact, in my first published, self-published work, which was volume one of on 21st century nuclear deterrence, I offer amongst various other things, a simple model where I figured out using some basic rules of thumbs about survivability, warheads per target, how many targets and all that stuff um, that prevailed during Cold War thinking Cold War One, I should say, and I said, now that we are in what I consider to be real Cold War Two, how many nuclear warheads do we need to effectively deter one adversary at the time, which was Russia? And I came up with a number through some simple modeling that I was amazed to see. It was almost exactly the figure that's in the New START Treaty. Now, I'm going to be updating this in volume two that I'm working on now, because as Admiral Richards said, with the breathtaking breakout by China with their nuclear arsenal zooming to the same level that Russia and the U.S. were allowed in New START, um, no, all bets are off. 1,500 strategic warheads that's almost certainly nowhere near enough to effectively deter all the permutations and combinations that are possible with all of the adversaries, large, medium, and small, that we face in the outside world. And that's an example of how the actuarial perspective and actuarial techniques can shed light, hopefully some helpful, useful light, on some of the key problems of modern nuclear deterrence practice. Now, one of the sort of the key elements, both for you as an actuary and then within the deterrence world is there's a huge psychological element to determining, you know, like risk, who takes risky behavior, you know, how, how do you sort of predict that kind of human behavior? And that, you know, that goes for actuaries and, you know, when thinking about the size of nuclear arsenals. So how do you, as an actuary, get your head around effectively trying to understand and then predict that human behavior. Because with humans, once they know they're being watched and they know that you're trying to predict their behavior, they purposefully try to change the behavior because they don't like being predicted. I would say, I call that the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. You observe the experiment and that itself changes it. Actually, that's an excellent leading question because within the world of insurance and pensions, individuals do what actuaries call anti-selection. 
which is to figure out what the insurance company is offering and then behave in exactly the best way to serve their own interests at the insurance company's expense. And hey, don't you think that foreign adversaries do the same thing to us and our friends? <laughs> now, good question. How do you learn about this and figure it out and address it? Um, I'll just say very quickly, what you do is really what I did, or I do what everybody does, which is that you've got to read the literature very carefully and thoroughly, think hard and critically, use a lot of common sense, all of your worldly experience, which at my age, never mind what that is, is not insubstantial. And whatever career you've been working in for however how long, you always have a great learning laboratory of human nature, of campus and corporate and government politics, of the strengths and weaknesses of different people you work with, um, cognitive skills, um, selective misperception. That's one of my favorite of all the cognitive biases. Seeing exactly what you want to see and discounting or ignoring anything that contradicts your preconceived notions. In fact, one of my favorite models in this whole area of psychology is Ted Locke et al. have done studies, very disciplined scientific studies, of two polar personalities, the foxes and the hedgehogs. The foxes are generalists. They process new information. They're the first people to admit they made mistakes. They love to learn and correct their mistakes. Hedgehogs have one theory or dogma that to them explains everything in the world. They refuse to acknowledge any new information or that they're ever wrong. And scientific studies and mathematically uh, rigorous peer review studies that he's published and others have show that in fact, the people who correlate to the traits of a fox are much better at forecasting than those that correlate to a hedgehog in any field from sports betting or political election outcomes to in particular, foreign relations and matters of international affairs and defense. And one could go on and on. And in fact, I have at uh, internal seminars and in articles and books, but let's stop. We don't have forever today. So if we were to think about, you know, other aspects of actuarial sciences that we can apply to deterrence writ large, you mentioned that by using similar models you and you were able to come up with a you know a similar number in terms of what was in new start but what are some other aspects of the actuarial sciences that apply to nuclear deterrence to help us you know do it better because it's it's one of those things you know it's it's like with war, you know, you can reflect on conflict and then you can learn from it. But with nuclear conflict, you know, we've, we've never done it. So in many respects, there's a lot of bad thinking that you can get away with because there's no experience or case studies from whence you can draw. Absolutely. There are a few things that I would be more than happy to say to answer that. Uh, firstly, the thing about nuclear deterrence problems and nuclear war fighting in the imagination is it's got great analogies to what Albert Einstein had to do with his famous thought experiments uh, that worked out the theory of relativity, where he had to imagine things going on over distances of billions of light years and billions of years um, in time. And he proceeded from a few simple empirical observations and first principles by working in his mind and on paper. And the fact is, is that nuclear deterrence, I find through my own experience the last uh, decade or two, is that the field is, for various very good reasons as you articulate, Adam, uniquely suited to being explored in detail and somewhat rigorously by thought experiments, because we simply can't fight a nuclear war for real out there in the world without getting killed any more than Einstein could, you know, travel for billions of light years over billions of years without him getting killed somehow, like sucked into a black hole. Say. Okay, so having said that, there's basically a collection of four 
fundamental techniques. These are not just best practices. They've been by now established as actuarial standards of practice that if you don't follow, you know, you're going to be answerable to the disciplinary committee of the board of directors. Um, and these are all directly applicable in defense and deterrence. And in fact, they are right now being applied by many people out there. It's just useful to consider how an actuary came to them from a different direction than if you worked in the military or um, the civil government or think tanks, academia, defense contractors, the more traditional prior backgrounds of, of your guests. And from the actuarial perspective, the first one is to do a series of uh, modeling with the same basic model, but across a whole bunch of different scenarios about what the rest of life, the world out there will look like over the years to come. What defense people typically call world creation, except instead of just coming up with the best estimate world, you recognize that nobody has a true best estimate world because nobody has any idea what's going to go on out there with all the volatility, black swans, discontinuities, and so on. So you've got to look across a whole bunch of different scenarios. The next thing that you do is you try to optimize your, well, in the case of defense, it's your force structure, your defense posture, um, optimize not to a best estimate scenario or to just the scenario you like best, but across all of the possible scenarios. So you need a very large number of very diversified, dispersed, flexible, adaptable platforms and personnel with tons of resilience, a super strong industrial base and supply chain, lots of devoted, loyal allies who you're devoted and loyal to, and so on and so forth. Then the next thing that you do, and the analogy I draw here is straight out of what actuarial and investment people do in insurance companies to deal with the need to match the assets to the liabilities. So when you have to pay uh, claims, the cash outflow, you've got cash inflow from your investments that don't whipsaw you or make you go bankrupt because there's a big gap or what can easily happen. You have to liquidate a bunch of your on the books assets, stocks and bonds at a time when the markets have tanked at the same time that the policyholders all acting in their best interest and your worst interest, anti-select and demand all of their money back, which by right in the contracts, so they've got that right at the same time that you are wiped out when you've got to sell off your assets, you essentially liquidate the company. Um, and immunization really has, again, a direct analogy to the question of national defense and force structure. What is the nutshell matching the assets to the liabilities in the context of defense and deterrence? What are the assets? What are the liabilities? The assets, again, are your weapon systems, inventories, your people and their training and their readiness and their morale and discipline and all that stuff. The liabilities are the threats out there in the world. The adversaries, um, potentially adversaries working together in various axes, evil more or less or otherwise. A great example of that is what's going on now between China and Russia. There's also what's been called chain ganging during the first Cold War, which is where one adversary or even an ally does something in their own best interest that is not in yours, and you are tricked or forced or lured into getting involved in a conflict that you very much want to avoid. And that conflict in the future can avoid, can include, sorry, nuclear war. So immunization requires you to have a very large and robust, yet not, excuse me, not excessive force structure where you've got different branches of the armed forces that are right-sized, well-trained and ready, prepared, that are flexible, adaptable, resilient, and that way you can do what the actuaries and investment people do, coming back to the insurance world, which is that you study what's going on in both your assets and your liabilities, make sure that they start out being matched and monitor for any changes and disruptions and then make adjustments as you need to. For the insurance company, it's to buy and sell different assets, different investments 
to better match the liabilities and even sell more or less of different insurance products to blend together into a good company. In the case of defense, again, the analogy applies pretty directly. You've got to come up with a future force structure, a concept of operations, defense policy strategy, and nuclear deterrence posture that are matched to the threats, not just right now, but going forward. And then you've got to study and monitor all the changes and make sure you keep up with them and get ahead of them. Because once you're playing catch up ball and you're behind the eight ball in nuclear deterrence and nuclear coercion and even nuclear war fighting, you are in deep trouble. Um, the last thing that actuaries do, and this is the subject of a major project that Peter and I have been working on for about a year and a half now, we've got some drafts of a short and long form of our article, um, which is the question of assumptions and assumptions that turn out to be badly wrong. Basically, another, the last of the, these four things, a key actuarial standard of practice, which is basically mandatory to observe, is to validate the actuarial assumptions, as they're called, that are used to prepare any kind of an actuarial pro, um, projection or to develop an actuarial opinion. Now, what is assumption validation all about? It's really got several steps, none of them easy. Uh, the first one is you have got at the outset to eke out somehow all of the important and not so important assumptions that go behind the analysis, the plan, the strategy that you're developing. Firstly, the assumptions sometimes are overt, obvious. Sometimes they are unconscious. You don't even realize they're there, but they play a critical role. And sometimes some of the players on the team realize that they're there, but for a small group, suboptimal, selfish reasons, such as internal competition, rivalries, and blah, 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 uh, they will not be completely candid with everybody else that those assumptions are in play and are even vital. So you first of all have to you've figure out to get all those the all. You've got to get lay out all those assumptions so that they can be vetted, correct? Absolutely. And vetted not just by you who came up with them, um, but you know, once you've set the specific parameters or values for each of the different assumptions, like for actuaries, it's um, interest rates, inflation rates, mortality rates, and that kind of stuff. Um, in the world of defense, there are all of the direct analogies um, and indirect analogies. You have got to then also, once you've figured out what you have to assume, you then have to pick the particular things you do assume in each parameter, and then you have to validate it and vet it and peer review it. I like the word peer review. Um, by outside, call them a jury, an inspector general, a red team, uh, a devil's sure. advocate. And there are there is, in fact, as I learned when I was reading lots of stuff for the assumptions failure study with Peter, um, there's an extensive literature of techniques from DOD, um, the CIA, and in academia on methods to validate assumptions objectively and thoroughly and to avoid all of the misperceptions and cognitive biases that like Shakespeare said, flesh is heir to. The ANWA Deterrence Center and Nuclecast team joins the Exchange Monitor in inviting you to the 16th Annual Nuclear Deterrence Summit, January 31st through February 2nd at the Weston, Washington, DC. Go to our website at anwadeter.org to register and receive a 15% discount. We look forward to seeing you there. Yeah. End of statement. <laughs> so we're now at that part of the show where I like to bring out Bob the genie. Now, if I, I rub my, ma <laughs> if I rub my magic lamp, Bob grants you three wishes, but that remember they're wishes related to the topics we've been discussing. 
And so for, for you, Joe, uh, what would be your wish number one? Well, I will tell you, Adam, as I mentioned, I'm trying to be nothing if not prepared. <laughs> I actually typed these up yesterday to make them be concise and edited them so that they're really exactly <laughs> what I would have wished for. The first wish is that all Americans be fully aware of the very dangerous state of today's world and be less divided and more engaged ray our extensive national defense requirements. So, well, let me, you, you say that, let, let me ask you a, a specific question. So you're a professional actuary. You're a, you're going about your career, you know, your mid career, you're successful, you're doing your thing. How do you then switch and say, you know what? I really want to know everything about nuclear deterrence. How, how do you know? Because you talk about Americans need to know and need to care. And you sort of made that switch. And then you spent, you know, a number of years now researching, writing. What what was it that made you want to sort of shift direction and devote so much time to the topic? Ah. I'd be glad to tell you. Um, as a Freudian would say, it all began when I was a child. Well, no, literally it did. Um, because I was in a way blessed from the get-go that my father and my two uncles both had a background in the military or in something worse than war, the Holocaust. Uh, my father dropped out of high school at the end of World War II, lied about his age. He was 16 and joined the Navy and served for five years. One of my uncles was a merchant mariner in World War II. He worked the North Atlantic convoys going to the UK. Uh, he told me when I was like five that although his ship, the one he was on at the time, was never torpedoed, ships in the convoys he worked were. My other uncle, because there was my mother and her two sisters, uh, he had been born in Germany, came to the United States in the 30s as a kid with his immediate family, fleeing the Nazis. Most of their extended family stayed behind and died in the concentration camps. Yeah. And what that does, so, it makes an impression on the to. kid. Okay, so well, yeah. to, to the horrible part of it, uh, the good part of it was is from the time I was old enough to watch movies on TV, like million dollar movies, the old war movies that weren't so old in the mid fifties and to start reading, I had a passion, a hobby, an avocation for military defense stuff, military history, biography, the technology as it evolves, the strategy and tactics, and I especially enjoyed books about the psychological and tactical blunders of military leaders who overreached themselves, which, by the way, as you might know, and I'm sure you do, almost essential, maybe not almost, every major dictator throughout history from Julius Caesar through Napoleon and all the bad guys of the 20th century, they always make the following mistakes. They badly overestimate how prepared they are to survive and win a war that they start, and they badly underestimate how well prepared we are to beat them and bury them. Now, that all gets to be very, very dangerous now when you have sociopathic dictators galore in the world, and they keep rising in every generation, who possess large nuclear arsenals. Because when they make that pair of mistakes, overestimating their might and underestimating ours and calling us weak and decadent and, you know, the whole nine yards, um, the recipe can lead again to human extinction. And that is basically what nuclear deterrence is meant to prevent. So what happened was after 20 years working in financial services, just like back when I was in a uh, beginner in academia studying algebraic topology, um, back then I said, this stuff is very interesting, but it's awfully useless in the real world and the limited lifestyle of what you are as a math professor working on campus didn't appeal to me. So I 
answered what I think of still as the call of the wild. And I decided to switch over into applied math and an ideal career at that time in the mid seventies was as an actuary. They were hiring new actuaries like hotcakes. Um, after 20 years of it, I began to think, okay, I've kind of done what there is to do in my specialty of asset liability management, which is exactly that matching of the assets and the, excuse me, the liabilities to immunize the company against bankruptcy. Um, and I felt the call of the wild again. And the first thing I thought, I hadn't really, you know, this all looks great in hindsight. The first thing I thought is I would like to write books for a living, which my wife's been doing in nonfiction uh, Sheila Buff, she writes bestsellers co-authored with doctors about health and wellness. She's been doing that for ages. I'd like to do that too. Uh, so that's how to break in. I looked at what I knew, which was it's fun to think about military stuff and it's fun to watch submarine movies and it's fun to read submarine novels. And I decided, hey, maybe I'm going to do that too. Almost immediately, uh-oh, you know, the nonfiction researcher in me came back in that before I even published my first novel, I made my first professional sale as a defense writer to the editor, Captain Jim Hay of the Submarine Review um, for a two-part article that won a literary award from the Naval Submarine League, the first of five I got from them over the years. And then I wrote six submarine novels, and the last of them won a literary award from the Military Writers Society of America. It was the 2006 Admiral Nimitz Award for Outstanding Naval Fiction. And I think to myself, gee, guys, thanks for noticing. However, there was a major life-changing event that my wife got ovarian cancer, which by some miracle she beat. But, you know, for a couple of years, I was totally busy with that. And that led to a Questioning again, more Call of the Wild, and by a very twisting rabbit trail, I said, okay, I'm going to finally do what I really want to do. What I feel in my gut and my heart is what's needed and important, and that is to switch solely to nonfiction, real-world national defense. And God, I say, I couldn't have picked the best and worst time to do it. And here we are, busy as heck, yeah. all of us, and the rest is history. So, so that's a life story and something of an extended answered. nutshell. <laughs> so now we've got come through, you know, wish number one, and that leaves us to wish number two. Yes, it does. That our educational system and industrial base rapidly strengthen defense-related STEM education and craft training and also expand quickly our whole defense manufacturing infrastructure and supply chain, including the intellectual product necessary for effective deterrence. Yeah, that's actually, you know, it's funny. It's a, it's a great wish because uh, we recently spoke with Matt Sermon, who is, you know, the executive director of the PEO office for, for strategic submarines. And one of their biggest challenges is, you know, industrial base and workforce. And so this idea of having the right people who can do the right things, because we, you know, we need more welders, more pipe fitters, more engineers, you know, more physicists, more of all of those things that the Chinese and the Russians are focused on. And we need less, you know, social influencers and, you know, things of, of that nature. So that's a great wish number two. Now, wish number three, your final Oh, wish. actually, let me throw in a quick uh, post amble to what you just said about wish number two. Um, again, what actuaries are forced to be good at and I think we are generally good at, is modulating exactly that awful whipsawing over the years and decades that can occur in any real world business operation like an insurance company or in the defense establishment of a country like the U.S. If you look at what went on between 1991 when the Soviet Union collapsed 
and over the years until now, there's been this awful bathtub effect in terms of the need, if not the availability, the perceived need versus the, sorry, the perceived, yes, sorry, again, the perceived need versus the real availability of all of the defense resources that the country requires. And we have been behind the eight ball, which I did warn people about before. Uh Um, That is exactly right. And I think, and I'm glad that the last couple of years at the conferences we go to and the articles that people write, um, we're starting to wake up to that. But the real challenge is that we are still somewhat preaching to the choir that we tell each other things that we all know there, but we are we, and I think not, reaching the 90 to 100 percent of the whole population of this country. And that's really what was the seed of my wish number two. Now, wish number three is very practical and essential, okay, that the vital modernization of all the weapons and platforms of all the legs of our nuclear triad, NC3, and supporting facilities proceed with no further delays. Yeah, that's a good one. No, no non McCurdy breaches, no uh, expanded schedules because of, you know, uh, infrastructure or human capital problems. We, cause you know, we're already 13 years into, into a uh, modernization program that is still 10 years from completion. So Amen to that one. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, well, unf- oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. No, no, go ahead, Joe. Well, I was going to say one other thing is that I tried to cover that and various related topics from the actuarial perspective in my first uh, and major deterrence projection. And I'm now working on volume two. And from what's going on in the world and the notes that I've got, there are going to be at least four volumes in this series. Yeah, that'll be a, a comprehensive look from Joe Buff at deterrence in the 21st century. Now, unfortunately, we are out of time for this episode. So, Joe, thanks for joining us on Nuclecast. Yes, it's been delightful. Thanks for having me. And thanks to you, the listeners. It's only possible with you. So thanks for thanks for listening to the show, and we'll see you on the next episode. So that was interesting. Uh, I had never really thought about applying actuarial methods to better understanding nuclear deterrence. So when, you know, folks said, hey, you got to have Joe, you got to have Joe Buff on. And, you know, he came recommended and and I said, hey, Joe, what what would you want to talk about? And he said, I want to talk about applying actuarial methods to nuclear deterrence. And I thought, that's kind of interesting. I've never thought about it that way before. So it it turned out to be pretty interesting. And it was, in some respects, for me as somebody who's been doing this for about 20 years or so now, it kind of confirmed the approach I've taken over the years. You know, I was not off base in the way I thought about it and the way I sort of tried to understand it and create rigor and empiricism. And so I, I thought it was a really good it was really good to see from a from a mathematician, right, an MIT trained mathematician, how he looks at the problem, and then compare that to you know how we sort of do things now. So it was a great interview. Hopefully, you enjoyed it. This has been a production of the NY Deterrence Center, a five hundred one c three that seeks to educate key decision makers, stakeholders, and the public to ensure a broader understanding of the nation's strategic nuclear deterrent. Our executive producer is Kimberly Charrington, and this episode has been engineered and mixed by David Frankel. Help us grow our followers by sharing it and follow the show on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter at Nuclear.